Good day, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Managing Your Perimeter. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Anna with us today. Uh, she's walking around some city, keeping people safe or de deciding how to. Uh, I'm PJ O'Neill, so I'll be your host along with Mel Lukens, who's here, and Mike Eby. So please, uh, we'll get some intros out of the way in a second, but guys, what's up? What's going on? What's new? Not that much. It's great to see everybody. Excited to, to do the podcast again and uh, excited to see my old friend, Mike Eby, who was one of my partners at the Secret Service many years ago. So good to see everybody. And Virginia. just so that's that's the soft intro of our guest today, Jason Russell, uh, who's the president and founder of Secure Environment, uh, SCC Secure Environment Consultant. And they've also created another one, which is interesting, Secure SEC Shield, which is personnel protection. Um, but let's get back. Mel, what's new? Hey, not much. Glad to be back in Florida after spending a uh, arduous week up in New York City and having a little bit of fun with the UN General Assembly. But uh, uh, just glad to be back in Florida. I missed the hurricane. So my uh, wife, God bless her, had the lead on making sure all of our dogs and cats and property was safe and suffered no damage. And uh, although just a short four miles from us, uh, the beaches got really hammered so they're cleaning up from that but glad to be back and glad to be sitting along with you guys again mike nothing too new on this front just uh you know keeping up with uh current events here and and was uh actually i was just gonna ask mel about the hurricane damage down there in florida and pretty astronomical the width of damage that this storm has, has caused being i mean how many how many different states it's affected <clears throat> with the power outages and that kind of thing we i'm in southern maryland and we we've just gotten rain but i mean it's affected virginia uh and i i think i saw uh all the way up to ohio too was having power outages uh because of the storm so tennessee just hope, hoping uh everyone's okay and that kind of thing, our friends down in Florida and the other states affected. Yeah, it, it kind of it, it, it kind of had a little bit of a, a wide berth, it, even though it was 150 miles uh, west of the coast. Uh, if you look directly a beam from like Tampa or Sarasota, um, the 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 devastation was, I mean, and the destruction was really uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, given it's, um, you know, how far away the center was. Um, and people really weren't expecting, we were going to get a glancing blow, but uh, we got, <laughs> we got a blow and uh, much more than people expected. Yeah, this is just these hurricanes. I don't know if, I mean, Jason remembers uh, when they, they flew us all down to, um, for uh, Katrina, I think we went to Biloxi, Mississippi, and we stayed. Jason, were you in that hotel they put us up in? Yeah, some of us actually stayed on a boat because there was really no place to stay. So they actually had a naval boat there that a group of us stayed at. But yeah, I remember those. Uh, that was terrible. Yeah, we couldn't even, the whole, it was the casino in Biloxi, and they had turned it, <clears throat> turned it into um, kind of like a FEMA refuge. And they had us, I think the first uh, eight floors or so were unhabitable, were underwater for a while and that kind of thing. And they had uh, the travel there, was we had to fly into Baton Rouge and then rent cars and then drive the rest of the way to, uh, to Biloxi. And then, like I said, they had put us in, we were in like the top floors. We had, um, I think we had like five to a room, which is uh, on you. You know, usually when we travel, everyone gets their own room. So, um, you know, somebody drew the uh, four other people drew the short straw with me. So, <laughs> you know that that'll happen from from time to time. That's it. This whole thing is absolutely bananas. All the stuff in North Carolina. 
um, with I-40 going into the river. Um, yeah. All of it's just absolutely crazy and heartbreaking and sad um, for all those people. Um, so we've, uh, we, we gave you guys a soft intro to Jason real quick, um, just as a, to kind of give his bona fides. Uh, he was a former Secret Service agent. Um, he was on PPD, um, which is fairly, pretty much the highest level along with Mike. Um, and then the Sandy Hook school shootings really kind of caused him to stop and think uh, about what was going on with safety in schools. And they, so they started Secure Education Consultants and then quickly changed it because now they consult all around the world with businesses, organizations, and yes, still schools on keeping their sites safe and their employees and students and teachers and customers and everyone else safe. Um, so Jason, anything else uh, I'm, I'm missing there? No, no, actually, luckily I, I left the Secret Service early, so I didn't join Mike on PPD. Mike and I worked together in the Detroit field office uh, for a number of years and and My got bad. to spend a lot of time together. Um, and at, like, at, as you said, PJ, I started SEC. Uh, we just, we call it SEC for, you know, simplification purposes. It gets confused with the bad SEC. With, well, actually, there's two bad SECs. The SEC conference, which is pretty terrible if you're from the Big Ten world. And then the Securities and Exchange Commission. So when people see it's us coming, uh, they know it's not one of the other two terrible SECs. So that makes them feel a little bit better. So yeah, I started in 2000, uh, you know, January 2013, uh, specifically at the time uh, to deal with child cares. My wife actually owns seven child cares in, in Michigan. So that's what was our original kind of purpose. And that grew pretty quickly to deal K-12. And now we have several thousand districts across the country, uh, as well as businesses. We do everything from, you know, one room you know, schoolhouses to uh, we're getting ready to go do a, a major sports stadium here uh, before too long. So a lot in between, we just recently started a new division uh, that you mentioned uh, where we actually supply physical security personnel to uh, to schools and businesses. We have about 175 people in that division uh, spread out. One of the things that we do that's kind of unique is we actually do third party directors of security, which is kind of a different unique offering. So we have, you know, security managers, which are staff, and then we actually have directors of security in in 13 school districts here in Michigan. So uh, it's been a it's been an interesting 10 or 11 years since I started it and uh, certainly seen a lot of different changes in safety and security over those years, even, you know, with schools and other types of organizations that we deal with. So you got to get down to Florida anytime soon. We're, we have a lot of clients in Florida, actually. Um, you know, some of my first clients, actually, my first client, other than my wife, who didn't pay, um, <laughs> my first paying client was uh, in Vero Beach, Florida, okay. uh, community preschool and community uh, the church. So, yeah, Florida's been a good good place for us and got a lot of clients down that way and uh, try to get down there as much as possible. We actually just did the child cares on the Disney uh, facility. So, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's a fantastic segue into kind of one of the first questions that that we've noodled is what what do you see as the current and, and possibly future state of security and ID and surveillance as as it pertains to what you guys specifically do? You know, security is always very reactionary. I think the what I've seen over the past 12 years is always chasing. Right. So they're always People are always chasing whatever just happened. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that that's ever really changed. I think the way that they chase is slightly different, but it always is very kind of reactionary in terms of what is the most recent threat or at least what's the perceived threat. A lot of times, actually, I think people aren't responding to an, the actual threat. They're actually responding more to perception, right? So what are people think that they should be scared of? Uh, we see that a lot in schools and our corporate clients uh, we see it a lot too, where if there's uh, if there's something that happens kind of in their area, uh, if what we you know kind of in their geography, they respond or something in their um, in their industry. So if there's a significant event at a similar type of organization, they'll tend to you know 
security will come back up in their conversation. And then once that kind of fear goes away, it kind of drifts. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing new, really, I think it's, uh, and I think this is going to be the next 10 years, is going to be AI, right? So how do we plug in into artificial intelligence into technology? Uh, maybe I think probably the area we're going to see it the most common in the next in, in schools is how do we plug it into behavioral threat assessment? So how can we enter behaviors in and, and other things that other things that a kid is doing and have artificial intelligence kind of give us some perspective on whether this is a potential threat or not? Uh, we've seen that as a significant growth in the past you know, couple of years. AI is definitely going to be the next 10 years, I think. Does cause I, I, that that's interesting because it's it's you know, the past couple of school shootings, you know, these kids basically said they were going to do it in one form or another. But, you know, with AI, it's only as good as the data you put into it. How do you get that data? Yeah, and I think it's still, you know, I don't know how good AI is going to be at predicting human behavior, right? At least, you know, AI can predict what you're going to buy. That's why you get Facebook ads and TikTok. Like, it knows what your interests are. But, Predicting anomalies in behavior, I don't know the AI is ever really going to be able to say, yes, this is this is a person that's going to do this. I think it's going to tell you these are consistent behaviors that we've seen in the past with somebody who's actually committed an offense, right? But I don't know how good it's going to be at actually predicting what truthfully isn't kind of logical behavior. If you looked at people that actually go out and commit, you know, mass violence or gun violence, uh, a lot of people show those behaviors, but only a small percentage of them actually ever act on it. So uh, we maybe have a little bit of success, at least uh, maybe picking up on some things. There, there, for instance, there's a there's a software out there now that it it essentially connects to all of the school's different information systems, and it picks up on anomalies in behavior. So it'll say this kid's not only is there are they showing some behaviors, but their grades are also going down and it kind of takes all the pieces of information and aggregates them for a school and says, hey, there's a lot of pieces of information that shows this kid might be heading down the wrong path. So I think there's going to be some improvements in that. But truthfully, I don't know how well AI can predict anomalous behavior, you know. Well, isn't there also already um, you use this word which triggered this uh, uh, like social media aggregators? that then AI could look for, just like you said earlier, either patterns of behavior from words or specific words, um, you know, uh, bombs, blow up, weapons, guns, yeah. shoot. Uh, uh, is AI going to be able to help with that? Or is that already something that kind of exists? It already exists. You know, Mike can tell you at the Secret Service, they've been monitoring, you know, shoot, shoot kill, president, those, you know, strings of words. Yeah. But the truth is, though, you get a lot of noise from that. So imagine, you know, your basketball team has a good shooter and somebody says, you know, this kid shot the lights out. And so what we actually do that, we do proactive monitoring for our districts where we'll actually enter those keywords. In, uh, and then we have an analyst who is retired from the Secret Service who actually goes through that information and says, hey, this is an actual concern and this isn't. The truth, though, is, Mel, kids don't use the social media that that you can pick up on, right? They're on Snapchat. They're going to be two platforms ahead of where we are sharing information. And, you know, the platforms that kids are on, you know, that you can't pick up on those platforms. They're closed or they're set up so that you can't. You can pick up on some open source, you know, Instagram and sometimes Facebook if it's open source and anything that's posted kind of in chat or Reddit or anything. But yeah. kids aren't in that, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's kind of the, what, that's kind of the, the WhatsApps and the Snapchats and I mean, you know, post it and it just then goes away and never to be seen again. Yeah. So I think that we find out about a lot of that information afterwards, but it's not because it would have been something we could pick up on. And truthfully, a lot of the times with social media, it's interesting when you see it, like the, the Georgia incident is a great example of, you know, after the incident, people look back at something somebody said in social media and somehow say, oh, well, that should have been an obvious warning sign, right? Like the kid in Georgia said, you know, I think he mentioned the date and said it's going to be my big debut or some kind of strange, you know, the the assassin 
uh, not yeah. Actually, this was the the uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, the assassin, you know, mm -hmm. tried to assassinate former President Trump. So afterwards, they look at this this post and they're like, oh well, that's a clue. At the time, it really wasn't. It could have the kid could have been talking about he had a new job or he was going to be in a play or I mean, there's a million yeah. things. But hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah, it's, well, absolutely. We see that everybody's, you know, and you see this on social media where after an event, everybody comes out and could have predicted this. Everybody is an expert. It's amazing. Right. Uh, you know, how many sniper experts, Mike, you know, and I can tell you came out after, you know, uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, all, everybody was a certified internet sniper expert, uh, you know, and what snipers can and can't do and what they should have done in this situation. So we see that pretty typically. Right. But uh, Jason, that's uh, awesome. That was one of my questions I had for you is, is um, if you guys did include open source monitoring as part of your your um, your plan. And I, I think that's awesome. You mentioned um, reactionary, everything being reactionary. And that's that's true, you know, in the protection world uh, on its whole. You look at uh, our agency, the Secret Service and, and how reactionary we've been to the events that have happened and then we're going to i'm sure there's going to be major changes um as a result of these two assassin assassination attempts that we just had but you go back and you look at um the warren commission after the after the kennedy uh assassination and and the things that came out of that and i think on our last podcast i'd mentioned that we didn't even uh secret service didn't even have a protective intelligence division uh, during that time, and and that came about as a result of the the Warren Commission, and then they they didn't even send a, a protective intelligence advance um, on you know on uh, during the advance week uh, back then, and then you look at uh, the Reagan the Reagan assassination attempt, and that created the the, the press agent right where we always uh, have an agent that's with the with the press. Uh, the press pool at, uh, at, at all times, because uh, everyone know you know that Hinckley came out of the press uh, area um, right there. So just all the all the changes, and also um, you know the as a result of the Warren Commission made the um, all of the president's off campus movements have to be um, the 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 press has to go with them, and so um, that's why there's thirteen you know the thirteen traveling press that always go in, in every motorcade. Uh, every Air Force One flight and that kind of thing. So, um, and I'm sure that you're, you know, all these school incidents that are that are coming up, and you guys are involved, evolving and doing research and what you, you know, what you can do. I know that you, you're a guy. You've always been very proactive uh, in, in your work, and that's uh, Secret Service. That's what we always try to do is be as proactive as we can, and you know, to try and mitigate the unwanted outcomes, and um, you know, you can only be um, at a certain point, you can only be so proactive. You can do everything that you want and, and you know, set up, uh, you know, every, you know, set up your plan perfectly, but you still have to have, you know, your contingencies. Hey, what do we do if X, Y and Z happens? Yeah. And, and, you, know, you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody, especially in schools, parents want complete 100 percent certainty that. There's no risks. And the reality is that's just if you want to have schools and you want your kids to go into learning environments that look like schools and don't look like, you know, max, you know, max security prisons, then there's going to be a certain level of, of risk that you're just going to, you know, that's unfortunately just going to be there. Right. So it's a matter of trying to mitigate it. Like you said, Mike, it's a matter of trying to think about ways you can prevent it with really a focus more on relationships, behaviors, you know, what certainly physical security plays a role in making sure that your perimeters are set up and that you have good processes in place. But as you know, you can put all the policies and procedures in place that you want. Most security failures ultimately result are, are human failures, right? They're not stuff. They're, it's, it's people, right? Miss something, uh, misuse something. Don't, you know, you, you, the world we came from, I think what happens even in the people that are probably the most prepared, right? I think that Secret Service agents tend to have an attention to detail that's un, 
uncommon in terms of just paying attention to the small things, right? But even what we saw at the Secret Service is you go 40 years without a major incident, you start to believe that nothing can happen, right? And when you start to get that kind of complacency where you're like, look, yesterday, nothing happened. Tomorrow, so probably nothing will happen. And as you get more and more, you go through that, you know, I think you start to maybe not necessarily cut corners, but you don't come with that edge every day that you would have if you were dealing with, you know, if there was more and more threats. I think now, obviously, if you look at what the Secret Service is doing, uh, even what schools, you know, there's a lot of parallels between how schools are responding to their incidents and how the Secret Service has responded, because now we're like, okay, what do we got to do next, right? What can we do to possibly, you know, make better? And a great example, Mike, is if you think about all the outdoor events we did, having, if it wasn't the president, you were not putting ballistic glass on the stage because aesthetically they didn't like it. You're going to see it everywhere now, right? Because, and it's, it's existed. So everybody asks like, well, if this was, if this existed, why wasn't it used before? Well, because we didn't think it was necessary. And then we realized it is. So, we, you know, it's always going to be that kind of, uh, that interesting dynamic between like, there's always competing values. You know, when you're talking political campaigns, they want to be seen, they want to be visible, you know, and, and they want to be able to, to be out there with the public. But we're, our goal is to try to, we'd love to just lock them in a room and keep them there. You know, that would make our job much easier, but you can't do that. The ballistic bubble. Yeah. Jason, I think you're, um, the, you know, the one thing that's stuck out, uh, to me, um, since I, you, you know, since I retired and got on the LinkedIn and saw, you know, it's, seen you know how uh well you're doing and how your company's thriving the one thing that that really sticks out to me is you're always talking about relationships and it, that is that is so crucial r really in any business right but people don't realize how crucial that is in, in the world of keeping people safe and you know you look at relationships how many relationships you know kind of go south um, for the secret service during a campaign year. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we all know what, you know, what happens is, you know, when people are worked, you know, more than they should be worked. And I think you and I both know that, you know, really the long and short of what happened in Butler was they were shorthanded. You know, the long and short of it is, is, um, you, you had great people out there, but, um, you have, you also have the RNC going on at the same time. And I mean, you've been, you did, uh, what, three campaigns yourself. And so like, you know how busy it is. You're just, you're pushed to the limit and that's when the relationships go south and people aren't, you know, people aren't warm and fuzzy, yeah. uh, you, you know, at that point. And, and I think that that's so crucial just to keep, um, you know, when, when you keep your people, um happy and and you have good relationships with them they want to do a good job yeah you know no i mean it's it's clear to me in schools especially right is we know that that's actually the driving factor most of the kids that commit violence say they didn't have a trusted adult they didn't have anybody that that you know so even with our on-site people we talk every time I we do a training, we talk about you got to make connections with the kids, maybe the kids that are actually trying to avoid connections, because those are sometimes the kids that need it the most. Right. So almost not forcing that, but really keying in on the kids, because, you know, I've responded to multiple, you know, bad mass shootings. And one of the things that's commonly said afterwards is, oh, yeah, this was a kid that kind of flew under the radar. Nobody really noticed them. So what I tell my people is you have to notice those kids, right? The kids that are trying to not be noticed need it more than anybody else. And I think back to your point, Mike, truthfully about the Secret Services, you know, what I think the field office model has always done is it's allowed for those relationships. When you look at, to me, when I look at Butler, I look at, you had an outside advance agent, which is very rare, you know, for the, this is really nuanced, but what was interesting, if you looked at the report, is usually when you're dealing with a former president, or even a candidate, the advance agents are from the field office, right? Because they have those relationships. They've worked with this tactical team multiple times.
But in this particular visit, the actual lead site agent was actually from the detail coming in from outside, which means he doesn't, he or she does not have those relationships. So, you know, when I would work with officers and tactical teams in my local area, we, we knew each other so well that if I said, hey, I need that area covered, I didn't need to tell them, hey, by covering, I mean, don't let somebody get on the roof with a rifle, right? That would have just been like an assumed thing. Yeah, but absolutely. I, thinking that, that not having those relationships, you know, and I think truthfully, that's because in my opinion, once again, uh, been gone a while, but the way Trump, former President Trump does his rallies, he wants a very specific setup. And the local agent might not know that, but an agent from his detail does. So they're sending those agents to do those advances because they know exactly what he wants. And in this case, I think truthfully, because there was that lack of a relationship, it ends up showing off itself in a pretty awful way. Right. Well, Jason, I, you said something a, a couple minutes ago that kind of got me thinking about how parents want their kids, you know, perfectly safe in school. Um, what, how can, how do you translate that to like after school events and, 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 you know, say football games that are not the same yeah. protection levels I love or they that don't have question. the same. Uh, in fact, we're doing a webinar on that very topic tomorrow because, uh, we started to see that as you secure one area problems, it's like whack-a-mole, right? You know, you, you, you take care of this area and all of a sudden you see your problems pop up somewhere else. If you look at actual gun violence in the schools, more than 85% of it isn't happening in the traditional kind of active shooter inside the building. And most of it isn't, you know, mass shootings. It's, it's traditional gun violence, right? So we're seeing such a dramatic increase in, in after school events that we actually started, we, we've been working with, uh, you know, Michael know this because he's from Michigan, but MHSAA, which is the State Athletic Association, we did a big project with them to assess athletic events. We also extended that to other after-school events like graduations, proms, fine arts events, because, you know, having plans in place, it's actually much easier for schools to plan for that kind of student arrival to student departure time but then when the teachers leave and the people that know the emergency plans leave, you might just have at a, you know, JV boys baseball game, you might just have the coach, right? Uh, so figuring out how to make plans for those situations so that you can secure those is super important. So we've actually um, kind of pioneered that idea of event assessments where we're actually going in and watching events and saying, hey, here's some things you need to consider to, to make your events more secure. One of the biggest areas that people are just totally missing is parking lots, right? You think about how we deploy police. It's like they start on a traffic point and then they jump into the event, right? And this, they kind of the parking lot areas where we have the, are almost never secured. So we've, I'm glad you brought that up, PJ, because we've been really focusing on, okay, we've, we've dealt with this air, to a certain extent, we've done a pretty good job of planning for the school day, but how do we plan for non-school day events and it's a pretty complicated process, and we're trying to really get schools to focus on that now. Man. Yeah, that's a that's a great point there. And and the uh, out here, I know just I tell you what, coaching uh, football out here, high school football and middle school football. Um, you know, when you go into to PG County out here, and you know the the it's 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 really I, I've always said this that the 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 parents ruin it for you know for the kids a lot when it comes to to sporting events and out here we just had the high school that my uh son graduated from and that i coached at they just had uh, a game canceled on friday because the particular school they were going to go play at on a friday night wouldn't change the game time to saturday during the day and the school thought it was unsafe to go there uh friday evening you know, which that's being proactive. And, you know, I understand that the kids wanted to play, but uh, at the same token, that school where they were going to go play uh, just had, they actually just had a shooting the game prior and the game was called at halftime. And so it's things like that, you know, going on here where, um, you know, we had a, a local school uh, also, there was a big uh, fight that broke out during the game, you know, between the students 
you know, that kind of kid. And so it's, it's just, uh, those, those extracurricular events are, I mean, those, those are just, you know, becoming, um, you know, really becoming, I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> just no, they're, they're dangerous, right? They can there. be yeah. dangerous if you're not thinking about, you know, we always see, you know, how we, we look at how are you deploying assets during those events, right? What I see is like a strange, you know, we, we've been doing these event assessments for, for about two years now. And with our schools that we're doing them for, we're, we're reallocating how they, you know, schools are very, it's almost like the NFL. In the NFL, you're worried about people going out onto the field and, and you know, running out. And, and high schools think that their risk is the same. There's, that's not, that's not the risk in high schools, right? So we see this huge focus on the playing surface and I'm like, nobody cares. Nobody's going to run out on your high school football field. You don't, you certainly don't need all of your security guards focused on this playing surface. Let's get people in the crowd. Let's get people in the parking lots. Let's spread this out a little bit. Let's have policies on what bags you can bring in, maybe student IDs. If it's a, you know, if you're having a particular concern um, you know, no re-entry, right? So kind of putting sp specific processes in place that might increase your ability to, to prevent something, certainly. And then when something does happen, be able to respond. And quite frankly, most schools are, are not even considering it uh, because, you know, they don't have the resources to devote to it. So they just do what they can. It's, it's, it's crazy. My son plays hockey. Um, and for the varsity games, um, we have to have parent volunteers who wear a yellow security jacket. Yeah. Uh, and there's usually uh, one or two police officers there just in case it gets out of hand, but we found the, uh, with, with literally zero training. Like yeah, here's we found the, hockey, you know, the sport where we found, we did our assessments. We actually hit every varsity sport, literally everything from bowling to football and the sport that we found, any sport that happens on an offsite, and bowling actually was the one that we thought, you know, what could go wrong in a bowling alley? Well, think about, you know, what we found was the parents, when their kids are bowling, the parents are getting loose in the bar. And <laughs> the parents are playing beer frame for their kids. Pick up those kids at the end of the bowling match, right? So these parents were getting pretty uh I pretty tanked up and then jumping in the car and driving their kids home. So we saw interesting things that we didn't anticipate, like, wow, this is a risk we had never really considered. And it is a school sanctioned event. So it might be something that the school would want to consider. Now, bowling alleys aren't going to shut their, their bars down, but there was no adult yeah, supervision. You. It was like just the kids and basically their parents were getting intoxicated. Well, so you, you've now created a segue to a very, uh, what I, feel is probably going to be controversial, unsolvable um, situation. And that is the role of the parents. And, you know, we all can do all of these things to be proactive on, you know, see something, say something. But, you know, these kids, again, how they're brought up, the environment that they live in, it it's all relatable and very, very um uh, there, there's a there's a huge proximity to this discussion and another discussion that won't happen here um you know about the role of parents in their child's life well uh, you know and if you look at the last couple of kind of high profile incidents you've seen the parents actually not only were they not doing a great job parenting they actually made it worse because they're supplying their 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 kids with weapons or they're at least leaving weapons unsupervised and yep. you know they're it's not just being a bad parent it's a being a negligent like grossly negligent parent and in michigan here obviously the you know we had parents get charged and convicted and i think you're going to see the same thing happen obviously with the with the shooting that you saw in georgia yep. and you know quite frankly parents in many ways make it worse uh, not only in emergencies that do happen, but also in the emergencies that don't happen. You know, my daughter's in her first year teaching this year. She's a kindergarten teacher and her school had a social media, you know, a threat. It wasn't even a real threat. And the parents just spun out of control because, you know, once again, 
they they just lost their minds basically they didn't allow the school to respond you know they were questioning even though nothing happened uh and what's interesting about that and i talk about this to my schools and it, it applies to everything is there's the reality of security and then there's the perception of security and the reality of security generally in schools has gotten better the only thing that really moves is the perception right so it's like even though nothing happened at my daughter's school the perception of security all of a sudden moved and all of a sudden we're, we must be unsafe because this threat happened even though the reality of security nothing had changed the perception changed and that also works the opposite way and that i think truthfully that's what the secret service fell into was that perception versus reality our perception at the secret service was we're great nothing happens right even though our reality wasn't that as good as it should have been our perception was that we're great and we found out that the reality was we weren't that great and we'd we'd missed these things and we hadn't really come up to the times in terms of using technology you know drones and other things that are available to make sure that we're you know and the secret service is, is famous for that i tell the story all the time and mike would remember this i remember you know, everybody thinks the Secret Service has like unlimited technologies, like we're on the cutting edge of everything that happens. When I used to do site diagrams back in the mid 2000s, we would use PowerPoint. Yep. And Mike could tell you, we used to, you did like create a box and you just write that this is the car, right? And you'd take these star, if you could figure it out, you take these little stars that you make and like that's a post stander. And even if you look at the diagram of the site in Butler, it's pretty rudimentary, you know, it's not like this high technology processes that we're using there. And I think that's unfortunate. It's still, uh, still PowerPoints, Jason. Yeah, see, so what's funny and even, even before that, and, and so and stars, uh, and stars. Yeah. <laughs> right. So PJ, um, I don't know if you had mentioned Jason was also a, a police officer in uh, Lansing uh, before he uh, came uh, federal and went to so, the dark side. Well, <laughs> you know, in Michigan, when, you know, we, you know, when you do your accident reports, we used to have the old uh, compass and protractor yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you would have to hand draw your little diagram on the, on the, what was it called? The UD 10. So on the UD 10, so we would hand draw the accident reports. Yep. What's funny is I think, uh, Todd doesn't does Todd Gilovich works for you now, doesn't he? Yeah. So Todd Gilovich um, worked with us in Detroit. Great guy. He was a former police officer too. And so he, a couple times when he didn't have access to his laptop or couldn't do a PowerPoint, he did his Secret Service uh, advanced diagram. <laughs> with a pencil with the old compass and protractor just like he used to do uh accident report so yeah we've always been you know and jason will tell you i mean we used to joke about how one of our main systems that we used to have in the secret service the old mainframe was a dos based system yeah. for years i think they they literally just changed that in 2013 that's kind of yeah. the old if it ain't broke don't fix it well for it's our just, also for our list and our listeners dos is disk operating system right the, the and, floppies and the flippies yeah and there's just the, the reality is is you know everybody does you know mike tyson said it best everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face Right. And so you, you got to have the number one thing, you know, no matter what kind of security plan you're setting up, you got to have contingencies and it, you got to have like, hey, if this happens, we're going to do this. If this happens, we're going to do that, which, you know, you look at Butler, obviously they had the contingent contingency set up. I think the reaction that the guys had was fantastic uh, as far as, you know, what they were doing. But if you look at. I mean, I can go back in my career and just say, man, we got lucky you know, after you do a site and there's just, you, you don't have, especially during a campaign and you might be, you might be doing an advance or post standing for the, the, the vice presidential nominee. And that individual is not going to have the same, uh, or in fact, the, the vice presidential nominee's uh, spouse. Um, 
that individual is not going to have the same assets. And so you're just really at that point, you know, the, the lower, um, the level of uh, the protectee, you know, the less assets that you're going to have. And, you know, some of these things you just get down to, you know, really you're just there as a, as a bodyguard at that yeah. point. And so, so there's just over the years, like I said, you know, this is just one of those times where there, there is obvious holes in, in the plan and, and what happened and, and they didn't get lucky. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I will say about that though, is what it did create for me that I use today is it forced you to be creative, right? So yeah. you'd have this problem. You don't have the, the assets to solve this problem. So you'd have to get really creative with how you would solve security issues with sometimes things that weren't even had nothing to do with security. So it was just a matter of saying, okay, how can I mitigate this risk by, you know, putting blocking elements in or whatever I need to do to, to kind of control this as best I can, because I don't have all the bodies and I don't have all the technology that I would like to have. And that's just the reality of the world that a secret service agent lives in is you're trying to do more with less. All that. I feel so bad for these agents right now, because these people are out. They probably haven't been in their own bed for the last, you know, since July, for sure. Nobody's nobody's seen their kids. I can promise you that. Right. Uh, Jason, what would you say um, at a at uh, let's say at a, at a high school would be the first thing that you would implement as far as uh, they hire you? What's the first thing you're going to implement uh, for them for a security plan? So usually it start. I mean, if, if for high schools especially, we we try to look at each school, you know, age wise differently, right? So high schools, most of your threats at a high school are internal. They're not coming from the outside. They're already in the building. So whereas in an elementary school, we focus really hard on the perimeter and good processes to let visitors in and really securing that exterior. High schools is almost the flip flop for us, where we're like, look, exterior security doesn't work real well on internal threats. So we focus more heavily on the behaviors and making sure they have good mental health processes in place, stuff that maybe isn't obvious security, but we know that actually does prevent incidents from happening. Now, from a security perspective, uh, you know, to prevent things that are non-active shooter stuff, right? So fights and other emergencies, we look at technology like cameras, but not only do you have cameras, but is anybody actually watching them, right? We're seeing more and more high schools move towards uh, almost uh, an operation center model, Mike, where it's like, hey, it's great that we have 700 cameras on our, on our, you know, in our district, but if nobody's ever looking at the cameras, then it's good for documenting things that have already happened, but it's not actually providing us any security. So trying to figure out ways where they can actually be a little bit more proactive in, in how they do security. The other thing, truthfully, is the biggest issue that we're finding right now is most districts do not have somebody that owns safety and security as their primary job. In other words, it's somebody's second job. It's like an assistant superintendent, and it's another job that they have on top of transportation, food service, curriculum. It's like you're also the security person, even though you don't have any security expertise. So it's one of the things that we've been focusing on is getting people with actual security expertise if I asked every superintendent, and this would be a universal across the world, if I said, give me your top five priorities for, for your school district, there's not a single superintendent that wouldn't give me safety and security in that top five. Usually it'd be top, it's going to be one or two. And then when I say who owns it, sometimes they'll tell me three different people, right? And I mean, God knows there's nothing worse than having multiple, you know, too many chiefs, right? And and I think that's the biggest issue we see right now with schools is it's like nobody owns it. It's owned by multiple people. And here's why. And this is true in schools. This is true in corporate as well. It's the one area that you can get away with it for a long time and maybe not even notice it. In other words, if you didn't have somebody running your HR, you'd know that within a week because things would fall apart. But you can have somebody not be in charge of security. And as long as you don't have an incident, it doesn't really rear its head, right? It's only when you have an incident that you're like, man, not only do we need somebody to own it, but we're we're 10 years behind, right? 
So it's just a matter of getting schools and corporate, quite frankly, to realize like you got to have somebody who owns this as a primary responsibility. That's interesting. That that's kind of like uh, being the lead advance, the TS and the PI for a visit. Yeah, sounds like not only that, Mike, but being butler. being that, but and not even knowing how to do any of those three because these are educators who are in charge of security, so they often get kind of led by vendors, you know, and people that have some other kind of, you know, we've stayed completely vendor agnostic. We don't have relationships with any component companies because. You know, we want to be independent. So when we make a recommendation, it's not because we have a financial stake. So unfortunately, an assistant superintendent who's also in charge of security is going to ask their camera vendor, well, do you think we need more cameras? Well, what do you think the camera vendor is going to say? No, right. They're going to say absolutely. <laughs> and you also need this other thing. And they don't necessarily know that they're wrong. So it, it becomes a big issue where uh, and it's just it's just not commonly done. We're We're seeing it more and more. And that's really why we started our third party director uh, service. So we would actually, we we place directors in district. They work for us. So they are backed by all of our knowledge, but they're within a district. Todd Gilovich, Mike, who you mentioned, uh, is one of our directors of security in, in Troy, which is a district here in Michigan. So. So we've, we've spent a lot of time um, talking about what the schools do, what businesses can do. Um, holistically, what are some things that you mentioned the parents and how they're part often part of the problem or become a problem, but students and um, parents, like when they're at these off school offsite events, um, other than don't get hammered at your, your kids bowling tournament, um, or bowling match. You know, what are some things that they can look for? I know we talk about all the time. You're at a festival. First thing we do when we walk in is we look and know where every exit is. Um, and we go yeah. kind of stand by there. We don't dive into the middle. Think, what, what are some typical things that some people can do? You know, I think it is a matter of, you know, human beings naturally have kind of a built in sixth sense. We have that ability to really observe. We just really don't hone it because we're so busy staring at our phones, right? So it's trying to put yourself in advantageous positions physically, right? So like you said, PJ, maybe I don't wanna sit in the middle of the row because I don't wanna be stuck in a crowd. Uh, maybe I wanna position myself in a way that if something does happen, I can easily exit, right? Even if that means I gotta jump over the side of the stands. Uh, I wanna identify, you know, maybe security people so that if some, if I, if I do see something, right? We always tell people, see something, say something. Sometimes they don't know who to say something to because nobody's identified. So it's like, okay, you know, I think, uh, Mel, you mentioned it maybe where you said the people were wearing the yellow vest or maybe it was you, PJ, at the events. That's a great way to at least say, hey, this is somebody, if I do see somebody suspicious, they're acting strange, whatever, I know who to go tell. Um, you know, identifying your exits, you know, having a meeting place. Hey, if we get, if we get separated, here's where we're gonna meet, right? Um, you know, if, if cell phone service goes down, how are we going to communicate, right? So having having that meeting place is is super crucial. I just had a big issue last week with a school that had a threat, and the fight was amongst the parents was, I want my kids to have their cell phones so that they can communicate with me at all times. And really, the problem with that is every school emergency I've ever dealt with, cell signal goes almost immediately because everybody gets on their phones at once. You know, uh, MSU, my daughter was a student at Michigan State when that shooting happened. And I had a hard time, you know, reaching her because everybody was, you know, the cell signal had been diminished. Not to mention, I would rather have kids in a school paying attention to the directions of their teachers and not distracted by their phones and things like that. So, um, you know, simple plans are the best. So where are we going to meet? How are we going to get out of here? You know, um, I tell schools all the time, there's only one person in a football stadium that can talk to everybody at once. And it's that announcer in the press box. Do they have a script that they could read if there was an emergency? I guarantee they don't. So that's a real simple step, right? Sometimes making that pre-announcement to say, hey, if you see something, our, our security staff are identified in yellow vest. Please, you know, if you see something, say something. Uh, if you're in an indoor event, identify the exits, right? Um, you know, simple things like that. Uh, can make a huge difference in an emergency. But once again, it takes steps to do that. So Jason, that goes back to, you know, another thing that 
uh, maybe you took with you, you know, into that. That's a great point too, is I know being, um, so after I was on uh, the president's detail, I went to PID as well. And I think you still remember, remember we would drop uh, off the bomb threat uh, call letter, sure. the call sheet there. So um, at a site, we would give this uh, sheet to whoever the phone operator is that day that had questions that if they did get a threat, uh, whether it be a bomb threat or any other type of threat, um, you know, they had a list of questions uh, that they had to ask. And um, I'm sure that your schools, your school operators have, are equipped with something like that. And you'd mentioned that, you know, that's, I didn't think about that too, the, the, the PA announcer at a, at a football game or, um, you know, whatever type of sporting event, soccer game, that's, that's the voice right there for everybody. And, you know, that person needs to be equipped with, with, with a list of instructions too, should something happen. Yeah. It makes a big difference. And it's, uh, you know, it probably never be used, right. But if you needed it and you, you have everybody scrambling now, you have a, a an is incident, you know, how do you communicate? That's, you know, you know, this Mike, the two biggest things that fall apart in emergencies are command and control, which is who's in charge and communication. If you can solve those two and have some contingencies built in to say, okay, if the superintendent's not here, who, who's in charge during the JV girls softball game, right? And then how are we going to communicate and have a couple backup or have a backup in place? I mean, if you solve those two issues, you've got a lot. You, you, you know, we talked about after school events. Uh, we had an emergency not too long ago. It wasn't at one of our client schools, but they became a client is the people that were renting the space didn't know how to dial out on their phones because you had to dial nine before you dialed 911. So they were trying to use the hard line phone to dial 911 because they had no cell signal and they couldn't get the outside line because there was no instructions. That's a tiny little detail that somebody should know if they're renting your space or that you know you should make make sure that people have some knowledge. And those little things can make all the difference in the world in an emergency. Absolutely. Well, that, that's, I, you know, I had not thought about the announcer either. Um, that's, that's, and it makes perfect sense. Um, but it's, I think I want to wrap this up by saying, man, what a fantastic discussion. Jason, thank you for spending time with us today. Um, we could go us, for hours. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we literally could keep going. Go, and, and, our our um, original run of show had us go until about 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah, there, there are tons. We, nope, you know, we no hope come back just because where there's a lot of other stuff that we want to talk with you about. Is this is, it's, it's topical and it's timely, um, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, no, it's great. I always enjoy the conversations, and uh, certainly happy to come back and and talk whenever you, whenever it's time. Well, all right. This is uh, this has been a fascinating uh, episode of Managing Your Perimeter. Uh, Jason Russell, thank you. And guys, we'll see everyone soon.